Oh, I hear someone. Oh, oh, no, no, no. Oh, no. I've got two names. Oh, oh well, you know what I'm saying? We went, one on the front, back and one on the front. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, good evening, everyone. I'm very pleased to see you all after such a long period of time. We have, uh, <clears throat> things have changed, obviously, with the virus in the world and so forth. Um, but it's nice to see you all again. What we are going to do this time is to try to do the seminars without translation, no translation. On the slides, there will be translation. So when we have a slide, you'll see there is English and there is Chinese, okay? Now, we're also going to record this. So if anyone wishes, anyone you know wishes, wishes to look at it afterwards, then they will have the opportunity of looking at it. If you want to watch it again, you can do so too. Uh, but anyone that wants to watch it, it will be on our website and we'll give you the details of that website so you can access it or someone else can access, access, access the lessons if you wish to. Um, for the sake of the record, my name is Greg and I'm going to be leading you through the study tonight about the Bible. Now, I'm going to try and speak slowly. I'm trying to, going to try and go slowly, but if you have any questions at any time, please feel free to ask me. So interrupt me, Greg, excuse me. Um, I don't understand that. And I will try to clarify it. And then if it's the English you're having trouble with, maybe someone else in the Chinese can add something into it as well to try to clarify. Yeah. Yes, yes. A large, a large translation unit. <clears throat> the idea is that without the translation, hopefully it is not quite as disjointed as before. Last time you have some English, some Chinese, some English, Chinese, makes it a little bit hard to follow perhaps. Anyway, to start off with, we're going to ask a prayer from God. Almighty God in the heavens, the true and living God, Yahweh, the creator of heaven and earth, we thank you for the opportunity we have this evening in which we can come to study the pages of your word, your message, the Bible. Please be with us and help us in our understanding. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Uh, just a comment about the structure also. We will not have a meal at the end. Uh, have a break now tonight because there's a seminar there. There'll be a supper. But if you wish to stay and discuss anything, ask questions, uh, and there's some discussion questions there you might like to look at and try and find out the answers to. Uh, if you wish to stay and discuss things, then we're happy to do that as well. Okay, now we're going to start at the very beginning this evening. We're going to pretend that everyone doesn't even know what a Bible is. So we have a Bible. Bible is a book, everyone got a copy? <coughs> okay, so I have a copy of a Bible here. The particular Bible that I have here is a translation of the Bible into Chinese and into English. So when you read the passage, you can find next to the passage in English, you have the passage in Chinese. It's important for us to understand that anything that we read in the Bible is a translation. The original Bible was written in Hebrew for the Old Testament and Greek for the New Testament. And so unless you speak Hebrew, if you speak Hebrew, you can go and read the Bible in its original language. You can read the Bible as it was originally written. If you can speak Greek, you can go and read the Bible as an original Bible there without the translation. But I can't speak Hebrew and I can't speak English and I can't speak Chinese, so I have to read a translation into English. Now, you good folks uh, are probably able to read it in Chinese and also a little bit in English. So you're, but you need to understand that the Chinese and the English is all a translation. 
Okay, so this Bible. And so the question that comes to us, this Bible, the, the word Bible in English just means the book. It doesn't mean anything more than that. It is the book. And what we're going to find out is that this book claims to be the word of God. It is written because God caused it to be written. The question would be, is it really the word of God? Is it really what it claims to be? You know, I could write a novel and say, this is God's word, but it would just be the, the, the ideas out of my head. It wouldn't really be the word of God at all. And so the question is, and we're going to look at that this evening, is, is it really God's word? So the, the word, the Bible here, uh, literally comes from a Greek word, biblos, which means book. And we often refer to it as the Holy Bible. And the word holy means it's a special or separate. Oh, we haven't got any Chinese on there, have we? I don't know what happened there. Um, oops, okay. All right. There's not Chinese on every slide. <laughs> So, so here we have, so the word Holy Bible means a special book. And it's a very special book, as we will come to see. A very special book. It's very different from any other book that you will ever hold in your hand. Now, the Bible, where was it written? It was written in what we call the Middle East today. Um, now, the Middle East is around the Mediterranean Sea. It's around the nation of Israel, Egypt, Greece, Italy. They are the, the region. So the, the Middle East or the countries of Israel and other countries there. <coughs> and we find that different men wrote different parts. It's the most amazing book, really. We find that people from different types of jobs wrote the Bible. And they wrote the Bible over a very long period of time. I want you to imagine for a moment that you are a publisher, someone that produces books, and you want to go and get five people to write five chapters or parts of a book that flow on from each other, that fit in with each other perfectly. And you would take these men and you would talk to them and you would say, I want this idea and this theme and so forth. It would be very hard to get five men, even if you were talking to them, to write books that, that fitted in with each other. Now, the Bible was written by over 40 different men, 40 different men over a period of 1,600 years, 1,600 years. That is a huge period of time and over 40 men with all sorts of different jobs from kings to shepherds wrote different parts of the Bible. Now, the map that you have there is of the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. Are you all familiar where the Mediterranean Sea is, where Israel is? So on the the map here. This would be Israel, this would be Egypt, this is Greece. Um, Greece here, and you've got Italy over here. Um, yeah, let's look at the gravy, the gravy sea. <laughs> what is the Are you familiar with that part of the world? No, but you know where it is. So you know where Egypt, where the pyramids are on a map. And we haven't got any nice big world map here. Maybe we need to. Yeah, I'm, and I will do that without. I can't even see the cursor. Yes, please. 
Yeah, there's some maps in the back of your Bible there. I can't see my cursor at all. Where else? That's the map. Sorry, I'm just. Sorry. Yes, your cursor is on the other screen, and now it's back. So there you are. It's down okay, here. Sorry, so I want to open Edge or Chrome or whatever it is. Yeah. You normally open them. Go Google maps.google.com. Oh, Google, you reckon? Right. Yeah, it's just the fastest. Need it up there, but anyway, yeah, that'll do. Uh, Google. Yep, that'll do. And then Google, Google Maps. maps. And now what we have to do is zoom right out and then fling it back to the other screen. I presume you were talking English. Um, yep. Okay. So, can I drive for a sec? Uh, sorry. If we zoom that right out, so you can zoom in in a minute, and you'll have to look at the other screen. Man, this mouse is hard work, isn't it? Mm. So I like how that's a good map. So now they can see it. You know, it's up on the screen behind you. Okay, yeah, good. Okay, on the, on the screen here, thanks Dan for that, you have a map. Here is Europe. That's Europe. This is Africa. This is Asia. There's even China over here on the... the yes, so... Um, and so the region that we are talking about, a little country here by the name of Israel and uh, other countries we were talking about was Egypt and Greece and Italy. Uh, you can and move slightly to the left, that way I can zoom in, thanks. Oh, okay. So I just couldn't see what I was trying to put on. India, India is near China. Yeah, go for it. Okay, so this is the Mediterranean Sea here. It is encompassed by land. It is all, all enclosed by land, except that it goes out through a narrow channel into the Atlantic Ocean. But this is where the Bible was written in Israel, in Egypt, in, uh, in, in, uh, in Turkey, in Greece, in Italy, over here in Iraq uh, and Iran. All those places were places very different cultures, very different types of places. The people that wrote it were very, very different. One's a king on his throne, another's a shepherd looking after the sheep in the field, uh, another is a prophet, another is a teacher, uh, a doctor, um, all sorts of different uh, uh, jobs such as that. And we come to this book, and you would expect it a book to be very disjointed, very different, all sorts of different ideas. But from the end, beginning of the book to the end of the book, the book has got themes that run through it, ideas that relate to things from the past and, and similar ideas that run all the way through the book. Okay, all right, so here we go a summary of some of the things that I was talking about, a period of 1,600 years. That is huge from the beginning of the Bible to when Genesis was written to when the book of Revelation was written. 1,600 years. How can you write a book over 1,600 years? Of course, none of us can do it because we won't be alive in 1,600 years to tell someone to finish it off perhaps leave some instructions if someone was kind enough to do it. But what we have here is that this book claims to have God telling people what to write over a long period of time, over many different places and many different types of people. Now, the Bible itself if you were to look in the index in the front of the Bible, so in the index you will find the Bible is broken up into two major sections. The first section is called the Old Testament. And there are 37 different books, 37 different books in the Old Testament. 
Okay, that's a list of all the different books there. Now, in these particular Bibles, you will see in the in the in the front of it here, some are in black, some are in red. The ones in black are the Old Testament books, and then there is the New Testament, uh, which consists of 29 different books as well. So two major sections of the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament, and with a large number of books in each, making a total of 66 different books. So a summary on the screen there now, the Old Testament has 39 books written mostly in Hebrew. It was completed about 250 BC. 250 BC means 250 years before the time of Christ. The New Testament was written after the life of Jesus Christ. The New Testament is largely about the, the life of Jesus Christ and his teachings. The Old Testament is largely about the nation of Israel. We've got the Bible, two major different topics or subjects in the Old and the New Testament. You all good? Thank you. Greg, um, I just wanted to say that the ladies might see that the verb there is content. The okay. Bible actually uses the word content. So the contents page. But, but we use the word index and contents almost the same. Okay. All good? So in that section there, uh, two, <clears throat> the two major sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, 39 books in the Old, 27 books in the New. The New has been largely written in Greek and it was written over a relatively small period of time. It was written during the lifetime of the disciples of Jesus. So Jesus had disciples, which means followers. And during their lifetime, after his death and before the death of the last one of those, the New Testament was written in that time period. Now, we started to get down to a lot of detail here and you find there some of the basic facts. So the Bible, <coughs> me, broken up into the Old Testament and New Testament. I'm not sure if you can even read all the details on that screen. Not too bad, perhaps, if your eyes are okay. So you have the Old Testament and there's different sections, what's called the Pentateuch, which is the books that were written by Moses, the first leader of Israel. Uh, you've got history books, history about the nation of Israel. You've got poetry and wisdom. You think poetry, where does that fit into it? There's works of poetry in there, uh, songs, psalms for singing, musical and so forth. There's a book of Proverbs by, by Solomon, the wise man who had wisdom from God. Then you have the prophets. And the prophets are interesting because they told Israel what was going to happen in the future. And we're going to look at that a little in a little while, the concept of what's going to happen in the future. And in many senses, that is what probably distinguishes this book from all others. Its ability to accurately portray things in the future. That's something that people have a lot of trouble doing. And you see it often. Before an election, people say one party's going to win and everyone's happy that they think that party's going to win. The other party wins. In Britain a few years ago, they had a vote on whether Britain should leave the, the European Union or stay in it. And all the, all the pollsters, all the people that made predictions said, oh, they'll stay in it. No worries, no worries. And of course, they voted to leave it. Four years ago, the people of America had a, a vote and everyone said, Mrs. Clinton is going to become the next president of the United States. Mr. Trump's got no chance, no chance at all. And of course, Mr. Clinton, uh, Mr. Mr. Trump uh, became, Mrs. Clinton didn't become, Mr. Trump 
became the president for four years. And of course, we're still seeing the, the, the consequences of that. In the New Testament, we find that there is also a history section, four books or five books rather, that deal with the life of Jesus, his teachings, and then the work of his apostles, the book of Acts. Then you have a whole lot of letters, letters written by one of his apostles called Paul, Peter, James, John, a whole lot of letters that they sent to believers in those earlier times to tell them how they should behave and what type of life they should be living, what they should believe. And at the very end, you have what's called the Apocalypse or the Book of Revelation, in which, <coughs> in which God predicts the whole future of the world from the time of the last apostle, John, right up into the future. We, we haven't got to the foot bend of the Book of Revelation even yet. It is still going, the, the, the prophecies about that. So any questions at this stage? Are we all good? Apocalypse. Apocalypse basically means it's the, it's the last book of the Bible. It's sometimes called the Apocalypse and sometimes called the Revelation. I, th I think it's a Greek word, yes. Yeah. It comes from a Greek word and it, it basically means that a revelation or a revealing. When you take the mask away, you know how the Chinese mask? Yeah. I think it's that. No, that's what it is. It's the unmask and the mask comes away. Okay. Yeah, that's a good thought. Hmm? Very good. <laughs> so when you find out what's behind the dragon. That's right. <laughs> All right, now we have a historical fact here, and that is that from the end of the Old Testament, there is at least at least 250 years before the beginning of the New Testament and the time of Jesus Christ. So from the time when the Old Testament is all finished, translated into other langu languages such as Greek, and so we know that it was finished and it was all complete as a book. There's over 250 years to the time of Jesus Christ. So anything that's written in the Old Testament that refers to things as predictions for the New Testament was written at least 250 years before they happened. And I want you to think for a moment. I'd like you to predict accurately something that's going to happen next year what about 10 years time what about a hundred years time in a hundred years time the world as we know it in a hundred years time the world as we might know it might be totally different totally different would you like to <clears throat> tell me what nations you think will still be around in a hundred years' time? Would you like to think you could do it? Could you do it? Will Australia be around in a hundred years' time? There's lots of countries like to take over Australia and take our resources. In my lifetime, Malaysia, Indonesia uh, have both threatened of Australia. At the moment, there's possibly threats from China and, and lots of other countries that like to take over all the resources in Australia. There's not many people here. We couldn't possibly defend this country uh, unless we have some other country like the United States helping us. Countries, com countries change. Even the modern country of, of China is only, what's it, 60 years old? Yes. And so it changes. Is it likely to change again in a hundred years time? We, we see the world is full of change. Would you like to predict some things that are going to happen in 400 years time? It is very hard, very hard, but that's what we find the Bible does. And that's what makes it the word of God. Throughout the Bible, it says the Lord says this, or God says this, or Yahweh says this. 
And we say, maybe that's just what people are saying. But when he predicts things accurately into the future, we think, oh, that's, that's beyond what men can do. And it's not just one thing, it's dozens of things. And some of which we can see still happening in front of our eyes today. But we're going to look at one thing in particular this evening. <clears throat> so the comment there is that any predictions about Jesus Christ were made at least 250 years before they came to pass. I want you to try and imagine someone that might be alive in 250 years time and tell me some details about things that would happen in their life. So you've got to firstly know the person that's going to be alive in 250 years time. You know, their great, 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 great grandparents aren't even alive yet. So you're talking about someone's not even alive, that's going to be alive in 250 years time. And you want to say some things that are going to happen in their life. In the first of Peter, and I'm going to get you to read this from your Bible, perhaps the Chinese or the English, English or Chinese, whatever you like. We want to read second of Peter chapter one, verses 20 to 21. Yeah, so Claire, would you like to read verse 20 there? Is that the first one? Second of Peter chapter one and verse 20, and Claire's going to read. <clears throat> Chapter 1, verse 20. Oh, one, sorry, second one. Yes. 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 Oh, very good. Thank you. Well done. I wish I could read like that in Chinese. <laughs> So what that's saying is prophecy. Prophecy is the teaching and the prediction that was written in the Bible. And what he said is that the Bible has been produced or men wrote down what God spoke to them. God spoke the message to them and they were, so when it talks about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is God's power. And so God caused used his power to make men write things, which became the messages of the Bible. Now, we need to be logical. We need to be reasonable. Just because I've told you, just because it claims to be the word of God and I say to you it's the word of God, should you believe that? Books can claim all sorts of things. You don't want to be a gullible person and just believe something because it says it is. Certainly don't want to come here tonight and, and this fellow Greg just says it is. Why should you believe me? You shouldn't. So we have to test the claim. Is there a God? Is the Bible the word of God? And you have to be an intent. Now, God, we are intelligent people. Now, if I said to you, um, I want you to sign over $2,000 to me so that you will be wise tomorrow. Would that make sense? Anyone going to do it? <laughs> I'll, I'll give you some paper. 
no one would do it. Your intelligence would say, giving me money won't make you intelligent tomorrow or wise tomorrow. Your brain would say, that's, that's stupid. That's nonsense. That's no good at all. So a book comes along and it claims to be God's word, God, a living God that's written it. You have to be intelligent and say, well, is, where's the evidence? Is there a reason for it? Can I, why should I believe it? Just because it says it is. And so that's one of the things we're going to look at the moment. Now, in Isaiah chapter 46, that's in the Old Testament, the Bible makes this claim. So if you can find Isaiah, it might be a bit of help there for people to find it. Isaiah 46. So we want Isaiah. Now, of course, the, each of the books are broken up into chapters and verses so we can find things. Some of the books are quite long, so we want to be able to find different things in the Bible. Once we've found them, be able to come back and find them again. So for Isaiah 46 and verses 9 to 10. Susan, perhaps you could read that for us, please. Right, so here he says through the prophet Isaiah, so, so the one writing this book says, I am God and there's no other God. I'm the only one. I am the only God. There's no one else like me anywhere, anywhere at all, not in the earth, not anywhere. I am the only God. That's the claim of the author of the Bible. He goes on in verses 9 to 10 from Isaiah 46 and verses 9 to 10. Wendy, you might like to read those two verses for us. Sorry. I read 9, verse 10 then, please. Sorry. Yep. Okay, so have a look at that very carefully to try and work out what he's saying. What does it mean to declare the end from the beginning? What does it mean if someone can declare the end from the beginning? What does that mean? You think about something, you've got the beginning of time, you've got the end of time. And right back at the beginning, God says, I can tell you what the end's going to be before it even happens. Right back at the beginning, he says, this is what's going to happen. I can tell you right to the end. So it's not just a matter of saying what's going to happen next week or in a month or in a year and 10 years and 100 years. He said, I can tell you things that are going to happen right to the very end before they start. That's a big challenge. That's a big challenge. Even in, our own, even in our own lives, we can't say what's going to happen in the future. What's going to happen? What's going to happen with our spouse? If we have a spouse, what's going to happen to our children? What are what are our children going to be like? What sort of things will happen to them? We can't even do that for our family. And God says from the very beginning, I can tell you things that are going to go right to the very end of a particular period of time. And he says, my counsel will stand. My, my, my words, my ideas will stand. I will accomplish all my purpose. I will, I will make sure that things happen that I have promised they will happen. And he says, from ancient times, I can tell you things that haven't even been done yet. And so we go and look at the Bible, which was written in ancient times, and we find that it's still telling us today things that are going to happen in the future. 
and we can look back over history and find out things that have happened. So the claim is he can tell the future and he can make things happen. In Psalm 22, in the Old Testament, we have a remarkable prophecy. Psalm 22. Now, Psalm 22 was written by a man called David. So Psalm 22 is written by a man called David. David is a major character in the Old Testament scriptures. And he writes this psalm and he writes about things which are fulfilled 1,000 years later on. So can you even, I don't think we can even imagine writing about something that's going to happen in a thousand years time. A thousand years, year 3000. Got no idea what, like our world is changing so quickly today in so many different ways. Can't even begin to imagine what life would be like in a thousand years time. And so in verse 16 of that Psalm, I'd like to read verse 16, perhaps Claire again. Verse 16. Okay, you go, sorry, is it? So here is, now Psalm 22 is a prediction. The whole of the Psalm is a prediction about Jesus Christ. And if we had more time, we could go into more evidence about that. But here is a prediction that he was going to have his hands and his feet pierced. And then when we come to Matthew chapter 27 and verse, so hold your finger there in that Psalm and come across to Matthew 27 and verse 35. Twenty seven, verse thirty five. Right, Susan. And the meat and the circle of life is directed at this one. Okay, so we see we see there that what they did with Jesus was to crucify him. We could go through more detail from other passages, but you can see on the picture there, and what they did, what the Romans did to crucify someone was to nail someone's hands to a piece of wood and nail their feet. A terribly cruel and barbaric thing to do. But they were the first ones in history to really do this. Back in the time when David wrote those words, people didn't crucify other people. It was a Roman thing. And so he, he's saying here that, that they were going to pierce my hands and my feet as a prediction about what was going to happen to Jesus. And it was fulfilled with a crucifixion. But not just that, let's look at these other passages. Back in 
Psalm 22, verses 7 to 8. Right, Wendy. So here in the psalm, talking about the crucifixion of Jesus, David says there would be people standing there who would mock him and say, why doesn't God deliver him? Why doesn't God rescue him if he really is, is God's uh, deliverer? And then we find when we come across to Matthew chapter 27 and verses 39 to 43. And, and you can see, you can see it on the screen there as well, that exactly the same words are used and exactly the same thing happens. Matthew 27, verses 39 to 43. So, Wendy, I think it was your read, was it? Yep. Okay, thank you very much. Well read, nicely read. And you can see exactly the concepts, the ideas from Psalm 22 is exactly what happened. People going along, wagging their heads. Oh, what's wrong with him? He's crucified. He's a bad man. Why can't he? Can He used to be able to do miracles. Why can't he save himself? Why can't he save himself? Come down from the cross. Exactly what David had predicted in Psalm 22. Going back to Psalm 22, and, and this is amazing. In verse 18. Okay, Jay. Yes, so so lots is when so we'll see it when we come to the passage in Mark twenty uh, Matthew twenty seven. He only had a, a single garment and he couldn't cut it up. It was woven, so he couldn't cut it up. So they tossed dice or took straws or something similar. They they played some game of chance to work out who was going to get the garment because they couldn't cut it. If you get a woven thing and cut it into pieces, it just falls apart. If it was cotton, then they could possibly cut it up and they all have a piece of clothing. But he had one single garment and they said, well, who's gonna get it? Oh, draw straws. Do you understand about drawing straws? You get, you get some straws and make one of them shorter, hold them in your hand and say, pick one, and someone picks the short one and they're the ones that get it. Perhaps throwing dice, and they all choose a number, throw the dice, throw, throw the die, and whichever number comes on the top, that's the one. So we don't know what they did, but it's something like that. Maybe putting putting everyone's name into a hat, and one of them's got uh, the, the, the name on it for the clothing. They all draw it out. Oh, not me. Someone else gets it. So that's the idea of lots. And so 
Matthew 27 and verse 35. So Matthew 27, verse 35. Who's read? It might be Claire's, I think, is it? So, yep, that's good. Thank you. So look at the details we have so far. He was going to have nails in his feet and his hands, crucifixion. He was going to have people saying, why don't you come down if you're the son of God? Why don't you save yourself? The soldiers were going to cast lots for his garments a thousand years before these things happened. And the details were recorded there. Okay, in Psalm 22 and verse 1. Susan. So there's a prediction here that Jesus, when he's crucified, would make the clock cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then in Matthew 27 and verse 46, and perhaps we won't read it because we're going running a little bit short of time. That's exactly what he said. That's exactly what he said uh, as he recognises the significance. As he's hanging there on the cross and he remembers what the predictions were, things he had no control over, and, and he remembers and he sees them casting lots for his garment. He sees people going around mocking him and saying, why don't you come down? As he knows that his hands and feet have, feet have been pierced. Things that were predicted a thousand years before over which he had no control whatsoever. So is this just chance? Is it just chance to be able to predict four independent different things done by different people. He had no control over the soldiers that were casting lots for his clothing. Had <coughs> no control over the people that were nailing his hands and his feet to the cross. Had no control over the people wandering around in front of him and saying, why don't you come down from the cross if you're the son of God? He had no control of any of those things and they were predicted in detail a thousand years before. In Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. So Zechariah is right towards the end of the Old Testament, almost the last book, the second, second last book of the Old Testament. Nine, 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 nine,
which is difficult. <laughs> so with books with different size print, it's going to be on different pages. So it's handy to have the chapters and the verses, and then no matter what version of the Bible you read, you can find it. <laughs> it's so you can find the passage. So if I read something and I want to find it again, I can write down where it was so I can always find it again, rather than saying somewhere in the book of Zechariah or somewhere like in Isaiah, that we referred to before, there are 66 chapters. A big number anyway. Yes. yes. All right. Uh, who did we go to? It must be, I can't remember who read last. Maybe Susan. Ah, oh. doesn't matter. Okay, so here is a prediction by Zechariah, probably about 400 years before the time of Jesus. And he says that the, the king was going to come into Jerusalem riding on a, a donkey. Now, I don't know if you know much about history, but kings usually don't ride on donkeys. Kings usually have a great big horse, a very fancy horse. The Queen of England, she's got magnificent horses. Alexander the Great of Greece had a great big, huge black stallion. Kings don't normally come riding on a donkey. Now, we don't have time to refer to it tonight, but in Matthew 21 and verses 7 to 10, we find that that's exactly how Jesus came riding into Jerusalem, on an ass, on a donkey, just as 400 years before Zechariah had predicted that. In Zechariah chapter 11 and verse 13, so Zechariah is predicting various things about the coming of Christ, coming of the Messiah. So Zechariah chapter 11, it was just over a page or two, and verse 13. Right, so it'll be Wendy again. Price. Right, so here we have a prediction about a price of 30 pieces of silver being paid, thrown into the, the house of the Lord, the temple, and paid to a potter as the as a price of redemption here, a price in some senses. Now, in Matthew chapter 27 and verses 3 to 7, and once again, we won't go there to read it, but just look at it on the screen. One of the disciples of Jesus was a man called Judas, and you've got the transparency, so you've got a copy of them. You can go back afterwards and, and read them, read the, the, <coughs> the passages in detail that we haven't looked here. One of the disciples of Jesus betrayed Jesus and what was he given? What was the price he was given for betraying Jesus? So he was, he, he, he came along, he told the, the priests and the, 
and the Pharisees where they could find Jesus to arrest him. And how much was how much was he paid for his betrayal? It's on the screen there. 30 pieces of silver. Now, after, after he realised what they were going to do to Jesus, he came back to the temple. He said, oh, I'll get you. You have your money back. You have your money back. He threw it into the temple. I don't want your money. I don't want to betray Jesus anymore. And then they said, well, we can't use this for anything in particular. Judas went and hung himself from a tree, committed suicide, and they went and bought the field, the field of the potter in which he had done that. Look at all the details of there. 30 pieces of silver cast down the temple used to buy a potter's field for someone that went into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. Okay, and we're going to... Or perhaps we'll read this passage as well. Zechariah 13 and verse 6. So right towards the end of the Old Testament again, Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 6. Claire, would you like to read that verse, please? So Zechariah 13 and verse 6. Yep. Right, so there's a prediction here of some people asking Jesus, what are these wounds in your hands? What are these holes in your hands? Why did he have holes in his hands? Because they had bashed the nails. The Romans used great big nails. They bashed these nails through someone's hand to hang them on the, on the stake. And, and, it, and afterwards he goes to the disciples and they, they feel the wounds in his hands to believe that it was him. And there's a prediction here also. So also in John chapter 20, we won't go there. But you've got the passage there that you can read afterwards if you wish as well. Can I just point out, please, Steve? The passage up there from the KJV indicates hands. In the English, the it's actually um, the wounds on your back. Oh, is it? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. All right. I'm not sure that that's so. There's a slightly different translation there. So in the in the in one of the main English versions, it says the wounds in your hands. The the Bible version you've got there says the wounds on your back, which could also refer to the fact that he was he was whipped as well before he was crucified and so forth. And so what we see here, the, the minute detail that is being fulfilled. Lots of detail. So just so you know, the Hebrew word in that passage is the word so the well, ESV is not a good translation. The ESV has done something else with the translation. The Hebrew word for where the wound was is the word yad, which is, is the word for hand. Yeah, so, so that version, and, and this is the trouble with translation. You all know the trouble with translation, trying to get the true meaning of something. And, and all different translators translate the Bible slightly differently, sometimes well, sometimes not so well. And so we find here uh, in, in the next slide here, and once again, we're going to skip over this because of time this evening, but you should go back and look at it in the slide in your handout, read that passage and see the detail that Zechariah is predicting about things that were going to happen 400 years later on. 400 years and lots of detail there. Now there's lots of Bible prophecy Lots of different things that are taught in the Bible that are predictions about the future. We've only looked at one, a couple of very small things this evening. We will look at other things as we go on with our, uh, with our presentations. The accuracy of the Bible prophecy 
leaves no room for doubt. God does exist. He is a living God. He is the creator God. And the Bible is produced or inspired by God uh, as his word. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to leave it there tonight. We'll just offer thanks for the supper. Almighty God, the true and living God, the king of the whole universe, we offer to you our thanks at this time for food and drink that we receive, the, the things that are so necessary for our bodies. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Right, Dan, you might need to. Dan? Oh, sorry. There were lines, rosemary lines. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, right. That's good.